At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Beth Chakala, the President and CEO of Project Assistance. <coughs> Beth founded Project Assistance in 1996 to transform our clients' approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence and execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Beth is a portfolio and project management expert. He's a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, including contributions to several editions of Macmillan's popular two book series, Special Edition, Using Microsoft Project. With that, I'd like to introduce Seth. Thank you, Janet. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, taking time to join our webinar today. Uh, just a quick weather note we are having uh, serious thunderstorms here in the Wilmington, Delaware area. Um, we do have a backlog, backup location in Washington, D.C. with one of my colleagues who's joining us today and doing some of the presentation. Um, if, perchance, we do lose any portion of the audio, uh, please hang in there. We have plans to get connected again. So uh, we'll, we'll start the presentation today uh, by talking a little bit about the webinar. Uh, what's, we're going to talk uh, just briefly about what, what is new in Microsoft Project 2010, uh, talk a little bit about what the different components are of the solution, uh, using some slides. We're then going to do a, um, uh, a demonstration of the software. Uh, first, you're going to see Microsoft Project Standard. We're going to run that from directly from the Microsoft Project Standard uh, software. We're then going to take you through uh, how portfolio management works in uh, Project Server. We'll then go into Project Management and Project Server. So Project Standard for the desktop, and then uh, Project Management using the actual server components or the enterprise level components. Uh, talk a little bit about project assistance and an approach to uh, project management solution implementation. So as Jan mentioned, well, we have a question and answer console. You can put those questions in anytime you like and we'll answer them at the end. So in terms of what's new in Microsoft Project, uh, the first thing we want to talk about are the key features around the, uh, the menu system, the interface, uh, the scheduling engine changes. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's happened with the integration of uh, what used to be a separate product called Portfolio Server uh, that's now Project Server. Uh, talk somewhat about the workflow enhancements that drive the project definition and approval process within the portfolio component. Uh, the impact of the changes relative to the SharePoint technology platform and how it relates to this, to this overall technology solution. Uh, we'll then go into some web-based project editing and scheduling and as well as enhanced reporting and business intelligence. So they're the, they're the primary uh, components we're going to review today. And, and as, as you uh, might have seen in the, uh, in the introductory uh, outtake or, or the summary of what the presentation is about, we're really trying to pick off those things that have value in terms of project outcome. There are a lot of features, uh, for example, uh, Excel-like features and how the cell uh, row heights and, and columns are handled. Uh, we're going to de-emphasize that a little bit for today. Uh, as many of you probably already know, with the size of this solution, we could spend uh, more than an hour, we could spend more than eight hours, we could probably spend more than eight days taking you down the, the nooks and crannies of what this solution will do. So we've really tried to pick off those things that really have some level of business impact, uh, some wow factor, some uh, hopefully answer to the question of, well, why would I move? If I'm using uh, either, if I'm not using Microsoft Project at all, or if I'm using Microsoft Project uh, on the desktop and I want to move to the server, or if I'm using a previous version of server like Project 2003 or Project 2007, uh, why, why would I want to move to Project 2010? So we really tried to hit the high points today and uh, keep our focus there because we do just have a short amount of time to cover a lot of material. So the, the next slide you're looking at is this idea of a scalable and connected platform. As, as happened with uh, many of the previous releases of Microsoft Project, uh, uh, what you uh, in today's presentation is really uh, a lot of a lot of improvements to what project can do at, at an enterprise level. Uh, it's still about creating a, a, you know, a large scalable solution because we are using the word enterprise. We want to uh, certainly be sure to recognize uh, the top or the lighter blue uh, part of the presentation where you see something called interface on the on the on the border here. We see Project Server feeding up into Visual Studio. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly when we get to the workflow engine and how workflow can be customized within the solution. Certainly the connection to Exchange Server and some of the uh, intuitive nature of what you would expect 
a project management system to do with an email and communication system in terms of the ability to bring tasks into uh, from a project plan into into an email system and, and time sheeting. Uh, Office 2010, uh, the obvious uh, connection with spreadsheets and documents and PowerPoint slides and, 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 and other uh, similar kinds of information that can be brought into a document management system through SharePoint. And then Microsoft Dynamics uh, being the, uh, the Microsoft Business Solutions uh, base uh, that includes ERP and client relationship management. Uh, the real focus for today, though, is really on the bottom portion of the slide you're looking at right now. It's really uh, three primary components. We see uh, Project Professional 2010, and we'll also, of course, I mentioned, uh, talk about Project Standard. Uh, uh, from an interface standpoint, very similar. In terms of its ability to connect to the server, we've got Standard on the desktop that doesn't connect to the server. And we've got Project Professional that, you, that we will connect to the server. Uh, we also see uh, Project Server 2010. Uh, some, of the, some of the features you'll see today uh, are going to be through uh, some PowerPoint presentations. Some of it's going to be live, so you'll see a mix of that. And then, of course, uh, this solution is built on the SharePoint uh, Server Foundation. And uh, not only from the standpoint of the connection to uh, to the sites that uh, the management that you can do when, when you have a, a project and there's a site associated with that with the uh, document management capability, a list management like uh, issues and risks, but also uh, just the overall SharePoint interface in terms of what we do from the web-based client. Uh, so the pieces you don't see on the screen here are the project standard and the uh, project web access. And so, and so as, as we go over to the uh, to the next view, uh, we see the uni the unification of project and portfolio management. For those of you who don't know about the history of portfolio management within the Microsoft DPM solution platform, uh, towards the end of the release, uh, or towards the end of the development cycle of Project 2003 or 2007, uh, Portfolio Server uh, became available as an acquisition of a technology platform. Uh, what happened at that point was we had a separate uh, Microsoft branded solution, but it was separate. There was a separate portfolio server, a separate project server, and a data bridge on the back end to feed data back and forth between those two platforms. That meant se separate databases. It meant separate user interfaces. So we now see the unification of the project and portfolio management. I think you'll find that Microsoft has really done uh, an admirable job in terms of thinking this through, uh, really from the standpoint, and you'll see this as we get a little bit into the portfolio discussion, about how <clears throat> portfolios are built, about how projects are conceived, and really some of the uniqueness across organizations in terms of how that might happen. So, so we'll show you today a sample workflow uh, that, that, that is a customized workflow using the uh, Windows Workflow Foundation within the project server uh, portfolio management components, and, um, and, and really then to, to be able to map that over into the approval process and, and then the actual uh, uh, building instances of, of real projects that then get executed and are brought to completion. And, and, and all that uh, process is really captured in the graphic that you see here uh, uh, from a top-down portfolio management standpoint, starting with demand management, meaning ideas coming in, uh, the demand for new projects, the demand for uh, really change within an organization, the idea that strategy is really a plan for change and that the way we implement those changes is oftentimes through a portfolio of projects that in fact are driving change for the organization. As we see those changes come up, we'll see the business cases are built, um, uh, some, meaning some standardization of, of the attributes of an idea, uh, how, how long is it going to take, what's its cost, what's its risk, what's its alignment with overall corporate objectives, um, uh, return on investment, all, all those capabilities. Uh, that we want to build into a business case. We'll see the capability of doing that today. Uh, the idea then of uh, prioritizing these ideas, comparing them to one another, selecting the best ideas through portfolio optimization, uh, making sure the capacity is available, and ultimately the reporting, both in the initial selection process as well as ongoing once these projects are, are, are uh, instantiated and you know, kicked off and started. Uh, which then we see the arrow coming down to the bottom right-hand side where we see the uh, if you look at the uh, sort of the top right of the bottom section, project scheduling, uh, resourcing those projects, time reporting, project report, the issue and risk management, and uh, the ability through this technology to, to involve teams for collaboration reasons. 
So, so that's that's the general overview of the solution today. Uh, in terms of how it's packaged, I mentioned uh, the project uh, family really was was four components. You see, if you look in the left hand column, we had project standard, project professional, and uh, in the project 2007, well, we had portfolio server and project server. So, if you look at just that bottom point, the single arrow now goes into this thing that will be known as uh, Microsoft Project Server which is the embodiment of the portfolio server and project server as we knew them in the 2007 platform. Uh, project Standard 2010, Project Professional, and then as I mentioned also uh, earlier, the idea of Project Web Access, meaning for team members and executives to come in, uh, not coming through any Microsoft Project Standard or Professional, but coming in through the SharePoint uh, interface, which is the web-based uh, component of this entire solution. So uh, before we get started here, I'm sorry, I went to a slide I shouldn't jump to yet. What I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Graham McCarty, who will be driving the demonstration component of our, of our uh, presentation today. Uh, Graham McCarty is a uh, senior project management consultant with uh, 20 plus years of experience utilizing information technology to provide effective change management. He has extensive experience working with Microsoft's enterprise project management technology uh, because he helps organizations improve in areas that include IT project management, PMO implementation, strategic systems planning, project management maturity assessments, uh, project management training, theoretical and technical, and knowledge management, and uh, is one of our resident experts on this whole technology platform. So what I'd like to do as I'm changing presenters here is uh, to introduce my colleague, Graham McCarty. And if I give you just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and make Graham the presenter. Unmuted. Graham, I believe you're unmuted. I think I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Muted. Splendid. Unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, as Gus said, my name is, is Graham, and I've been working for Project Assistance for quite a while now. And Project 2010 is the uh, latest um, iteration from Microsoft, and we're really excited by it. It's got a lot of interesting features, and it looks pretty different from what we may be familiar with in the past. So what I'd like to do is, as Gus said, go over the uh, project client, and in fact, I'm running project professional, but not being connected to a server, it behaves in just the same way as project standard. And then we're going to look at some, there'll probably be screenshots of the project server and portfolio server, which are now all in one, one bundle, uh, to discuss the new features there. There's been quite a lot of discussion, uh, plenty of presentations around over the last sort of two or three months about the, the features of of Microsoft Project, and I'd like to sort of take a perspective on coming to this after being familiar with Project 2003 or 2007, uh, what are the bits of it that you need to know? And really, there are, I think there are two aspects that are pretty different uh, in this release compared with previous ones. And one of them is about standardizing the Microsoft look and feel. So for that, we'll be talking about the ribbon, we'll be talking about the, uh, the function tabs as opposed to the, the old menu bar. The other is more related to how people have been developing projects. And what Microsoft is doing here, I think, is encouraging more of a top-down approach. You may remember from earlier versions that the only way to get a, a schedule was to have tasks which added up to the schedule you wanted, which almost forced you to 
think in detail before you'd really got very far with thinking about the uh, the general or the top down. So without the preamble, I'm going to uh, have a look at this um, standard project uh, Gantt chart view. And the, the thing we notice first, prob probably, is the ribbon. And anyone who's used any of the recent Microsoft Office uh, products will be familiar with the uh, the approach, the, the paradigm, if you like. We have these tabs which relate to different kinds of functions. And resource, project, view, and so on. And as we select one or the other of them, you'll notice that the uh, the detailed icons on the ribbon uh, change to be appropriate to what you're looking at. So when we look at task, we've got the selection of the, the view. We've got the paste uh, copy. We've got the, the font. We've got things that you would do with tasks, like indenting them, uh, breaking them, linking them, marking them as 100% uh, or 25% complete. Uh, here are a couple of new ones, the manually scheduled and auto scheduled. And I'll get back to those when we talk about the uh, top-down features of project um, planning. Uh, task inspection, that's, you may have come across that in project 2007. This is uh, rather more beefed up than, than that one was. Uh, and then we've got the um, recurring tasks and inserting different different kind of tasks, whether it's summary, milestone, uh, which avoids you having to remember that you're going to put a zero duration against the milestone and so on. Not that that was that difficult. And then task notes and scroll to task. One of my favorite buttons. Looking at resources, this is all about the teams, assigning resources, uh, building the team, uh, doing team planning. And here are some of the uh, grayed out, because I'm not actually connected to a, uh, a server at the moment. Uh, leveling and leveling options. Uh, project information. So this was. Uh, what we used to have under the project option on the on the menu tab. So we've got project information, uh, custom fields, uh, links between projects that we used to see on the under the tools option. Uh, changing working time, uh, calculation. Those are all under the various uh, tools uh, selections from the menu bar. Uh, update project. Uh, that would be uh, rescheduling work and the reporting. Uh, we've still got visual reports, which remember is the uh, pivot table, Excel pivot table, extracted from project information, uh, spelling check, and so on. Views. Here we have the selection of views. We've got the Gantt, we've got the task usage, and then the sort of other um, oh, more specific ones. Resource views, resource usage, resource sheet, and so on. Um, filtering, the zoom, and whether to select just particular tasks or, or the entire project. And uh, format. We've got different uh, styles of Gantt chart we could use. So pick a different one there. So this is ab about the, the presentation and what the layout would look like, whether you insert, in, insert a column and notice that you now have a um, full uh, text entry for selecting the column. So rather than just having to hit T and hope you could scroll through relatively few T's before you got to task. I hit TA and now we just get the task calendar or 
task mode. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, baselining, show, uh, show baselines, and showing slippage. So this is all about um, view information. It's possible to uh, modify the, uh, the rhythms. Anyone who was listening to the MPUG uh, presentation earlier will have heard how to add macros to, a, uh, to the rhythm. And then the file, we have uh, the traditional stuff, you know, save, open, close. A lot of things are hidden under options. Anyone who is used to going to the tools uh, option on the menu bar uh, will find there's a lot of the stuff that you wonder where it went to actually ended up under file and project options. So now let's have a quick look at the, at the top-down approach. For a start, we've got a look at task um, you can see at the bottom of the screen it says here new tasks are manually scheduled. So I'm going to insert a summary task. We've got a button here for that, and that gives me space for typing in and it prompts me it says, well you said this was a summary task, presumably it's got a um, a child, a detailed task underneath it, and yes, it has. Now, here's something odd. Uh, notice that when I type in the task name, you would usually expect to see a duration of one day and start date and the finish date, which would typically be the, the start date of the, the project. Well, we don't have that. We don't have um, a duration, we don't have a start, we don't have a finish. And that's because of this. Um, it's the task mode, and it's saying manually scheduled. Now, for the summary task, I'm going to make that 10 days. And here, Just going to put something to remind me that we need to come back at some point in the future and actually put in a, a duration that, that means something. Another detailed task. And again, we don't know how long this is going to take, except this time I think I probably do know. I'm going to guess it at two days for this one. So we get the uh, duration only task, another detailed task, and it's speculating the start will be on the 27th and the finish on the 28th. If we now make these ones, instead of being manually scheduled, I'm going to highlight these three and make them auto-scheduled. Notice that don't know yet has disappeared. The the one day, or the one day has replaced the don't know yet, and the two day has stayed. And we have dates. Uh, I, you may remember when I was looking at uh, the uh, format, I checked the Slack box. You see this line over on the Gantt chart? That is the Slack. If I uncheck that, then Slack disappears. Type in 10 days as the duration for the summary task. And sure enough, we get a duration of 10 days showing that. But it We've only got two days' worth of tasks, so if I um, link these two, we've got 
three days of tasks. And notice how the, the actual task information rolls up. So this is part of what I was saying about the, the top-down approach. We may know from our uh, high-level planning that this phase would typically take uh, 10 days. Don't know exactly what all the detail of those tasks are, but when it comes to, to planning, we're going to assume that it is a 10-day um, a phase. Another uh, feature about the, uh, the, the top-down approach is you often get uh, tasks which, or change requests, which would imply doing some new tasks, but you're not yet sure whether you, you're actually going to do them or not. Uh, you haven't got the approval to carry out the, the change. And I've simulated that here with this option one and option two. Now, option two is going to take 16 days. Option 10 takes uh, 10 days. So I'm going to say on this one that this one, the option two, is only speculative. So under this active column, I'm going to say no. And notice what happens. It gets grayed out. And option one is now driving the critical path. So I put in a, another task, um, a finished milestone. I think it will become even more clear. So this is going to have <coughs> predecessors of five and six. And notice that it's driven by the uh, finish of task five. Task six is there. We put it in because we may be doing a what-if calculation based on the, the change request that came in. But until it gets approval, we're going to stick with option one. When it does get approval, then we could swap these two around and do a calculation. Uh, uh, and this, at the moment, is manually scheduled, make it auto-scheduled, and it gets driven by the, um, the finish date of the, what is now the active task. And if you're just wondering what the inspect looks like, inspect that task, we get an extra extra panel which shows us what drives it. In this case, the predecessor is option two. We've got to finish the start um, link. And that was works pretty similarly to the way it did in um, Project 2007. What, what you would see different here if we had resources assigned is that if there was any um, resource over allocation or leveling required, uh, you would see uh, an entry in here that said something uh, needed to be done with the, the resource assignments. So I think we looking at projects. Um, custom fields, this is where you would, would normally expect to, to see the custom field. That would have been under tools, customize fields, uh, change working time, calculate, that's the F9 button, and visual reports for anyone who didn't see it under um, project 2007. Uh, this is where you would, uh, you would work on that. Now, I think um, I'll probably, we'll, we'll come back later in case there are any questions about this, but 
I do want to leave time to get to the uh, information that we have, um, I think only in, in slide form, but it's important to talk about project server and portfolio server. So Gus, do you want to say anything about that or should I go straight on? I guess I go straight on. Graham, my apologies. It's a couple of clicks for me to get on mute. No, you're doing great. Thanks. Okay. In that case, uh, these are uh, uh, yeah, you're, I think where you want to go, Graham, is about slide number 18. Yeah. Okay, um, one of the, the things that came with Portfolio Server was the importance of having standard information about projects so that a calculation could be done about comparing projects and picking the, the optimum ones for the constrained resources and budget that you might have in your organization. This means that you need a way of getting consistent information, probably fairly early in the life of a project. You don't want to get very far into the detailed planning, uh, just so you can get detailed cost or schedule or risk information before determining whether um, it goes into the portfolio selection process or not. So one of the first things you will see in project server is a, a, an option to create a new project in project server, not project professional. And when you do that, you initiate a workflow. And this is a, a screenshot from the top of the uh, project server screen when, you're, when you have workflow. And the different uh, phases or the, the different um, pieces of information that are being supplied probably by, by different people are represented by, the, by these boxes. And then you have checkpoints where the uh, project information on an individual project is checked for completeness. And the way this is done is using SharePoint with with a workflow. And in order to uh, customize that workflow, you would use something like uh, Visual Studio. Uh, the uh, demo environment put out by Microsoft includes a uh, set of demo data for a, pod, a mythical company called Contoso. And that has a standard workflow that that comes with it. But if you want to change it or if you want to develop your own, you need to get into the um, into something like Visual Studio. The workflow is, is represented in phases. And you have different steps within each phase. And for each step, there will be data provided using a, an entry form. So initial review has some data associated with it. And in this screenshot, the initial review has been completed. Um, we're now at the step of define for major project. And this is where, in the uh, Contoso version of life, one or more business driver impact ratings would be defined. Uh, the workflow include steps for automatic uh, approval or rejection. So if we had a, an initial project and it had uh, information which did not meet the initial approval criteria, then it could be automatically rejected. And again, this would be defined as, as part of the workflow. And you can see here that it can go on through, through multiple phases multiple stages. 
there was a reference in that last slide to business drivers. Uh, one of the uh, keys to successful portfolio management is alignment with business goals. Uh, a project is intended to introduce a change, and the change is intended to align the business operations more closely with what the uh, business intends to achieve. Um, how much any one project contributes to those business goals is something that is assessed by the, typically by the project sponsor, but maybe the project manager or um, a PMO would contribute to that information. The screen you see now is a way of grading the list of business drivers. So we've got expand into new markets and segments is one business driver. And you see that on the left. And then this is, a, as you can see, a pairwise comparison between that and other business drivers on the right. Improved customer satisfaction score. So the assessment here, typically by the oh, senior people in the organization, CIO, COO, maybe CFO, um, is that expand into new markets and segments is more important than improving customer satisfaction score. So this is a business that's intent on growth. Uh, you see further down, uh, expand into new markets and segments is as important as increasing market share in existing markets. They want to grow, but grow both in new markets and in, in current markets. And the, that drop-down list you see in the middle is the way that, um, as part of the configuration, you would select the relative priority of different business drivers. And this is where, for any particular project, you would select the business drivers and how much this project matches up with any one of those. So the, the project we're talking about, um, in this case, is strong for support into expand into new markets and segments. Um, even more so, extreme in improving customer satisfaction score. The idea is that all projects would have a, uh, a rating like this. And then you get into this view, which is looking at all the projects down the left and all the drivers across the, across the top. And you see the relative um, scores of, of all of them. Where that leads to is the portfolio calculation. That chart you see on the left, uh, headed Efficient Frontier, is the calculation of which of all our projects can we do within the constrained, the, up here you see total cost of 10,684,000. Uh, within that cost, which of these projects can we do and which will contribute most to our most important business drivers? And then you get to the point of saying, well, I want to include a specific one. I want, really want to include eCRM, and I don't care so much about others. And you get into the, uh, the business of um, doing the portfolio adjustment to get the uh, the balance that you as an executive think uh, think you should have in your projects. And that can feed into a resource constraint analysis. Uh, there's a, an option for team planning, which is assigning typically generic resources month by month or period by period to the project. Remember, at the moment, we still have no particular tasks. We're just assuming that we will be using um, analysts and programmers and uh, testers 
in particular periods. And this helps with the um, portfolio calculation. The Business Intelligence Center, this is where you get some, some data out of everything you've been putting in. Uh, this is a, a dashboard view, and those um, icons at the top have really translate into green, uh, yellow, and red. You've got a, a, below that a, a bar chart of number of projects by, by phase and a pie chart of projects by department. And here again is a list of projects with their key performance indicators as red, yellow, green, and if you prefer to use stoplights, and so be it. And the project center, this is a fairly familiar view to anyone who's used uh, project server in 2007. And that, I think, is... Going, oh, going backwards now. Uh, time sheets. Um, Microsoft seems to have a different approach to, to time sheets with every release of uh, project server that they come out with. And now, this time, they've gone back to having just a, a single time sheet um, and including on it the uh, administrative time. I see we're marching on in time, so I will, I think at this point, hand back to Gus, and that should leave us a few minutes for project assistance um, offerings and for questions. Gus? Thank you, Graham. Uh, what I'd like to do is just spend the last couple of minutes here just to talk just a bit uh, past Graham's slides. I'd like to spend just a moment uh, talking about uh, some approaches to implementing this uh, technology platform. And uh, briefly, uh, Project Assistance um, is a consulting firm that provides uh, solutions which ensure the flawless execution of strategy, typically in a project intensive environment. I mentioned uh, when I talked about collecting ideas for projects, I mentioned that you know really the onboarding process for projects into a portfolio is, is really about performing projects which are the implement, typically implementing a strategy, whether it's in an IT department, whether it's research and development for new products, whether it's even projects or uh, organizations who sell projects for a living, like engineering, uh, clinical research organizations, professional services. Uh, all, all those, in all those situations, what we're really looking at is a desire to have a flawless execution of an organization's strategy in an environment where projects are the way that we implement strategy in, in all those areas I just mentioned. So, so the, you know, the, the, the approaches we take uh, or what our customers want uh, and therefore what, what our approach is, is really focused on is how do we implement solutions like this while reducing the risk of failure? Uh, there's a reluctance to put in portfolio and project management systems because they're risky. They're expensive. Um, there's a question when the, when the expense involved is, is there a fact of return on investment? There's a concern about, uh, we hear terms like unnecessary overhead or too much planning. Uh, so, you know, we have to be sensitive to how we reduce risk and maximize ROI. Um, these, these projects can go on for a long time. People recognize that, <coughs> excuse me, to get to something like a uh, very solid resource management solution might be a two, three, four year process. So, what are those intermediate uh, realizations of value that can occur? Those intermediate stop off points, what I, what I call a, uh, uh, creating a move towards continued investment in, the, in these kinds of solutions. And ultimately, how do you make it stick? Well, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And, and so what we see is, we see a lot of spend in what I call column two. There's an awful lot of, if you were to analyze our revenues or Microsoft revenues or other consulting companies' revenues, what you would find out is there's an awful lot of spend on 
uh, building specs, developing things, installing, configuring, implementing, training, and rolling out. So, so I call that implement stuff, implement technology, implement uh, people capabilities through training and uh, an implementing process. But really, the, uh, the real value in these solutions comes through some thinking in the front end that says we're going to limit what we're going to enable our process technology and people to do uh, by putting some kind of a governor, just like you would put a governor on, on an engine so it doesn't get overheated or, or run too fast or have too many RPIs and, and RPMs and burn the engine out. Uh, same thing is true of this front end process that we call assessment strategy and tactical planning. It's an exercise uh, that we recommend whether we do it or not for an organization to take a step back and say where are we t today from a maturity standpoint, where, do, where are we trying to get to, how wide is the gap, and how do we put some kind of a reasonable digestion plan to, to, that results in a, uh, a realistic set of requirements. So that when we get to column two, there's, a, there's really a way to, to get those requirements implemented. And really what, the way I like to describe this is when column one's not done, what happens is there's an awful lot of spend in column two. And then in column three, when we get to the governance and support area, when we realize what we actually realistically can do, what we see is uh, usually compromises. Uh, we're not going to get to resource management as fast as we had hoped, so we're going to back off. Uh, we can't do timesheets, so we're going to back off. Or we can't do everybody, or the executives aren't using the dashboard, or the information is not credible. And, and so what we suggest is a good column one approach really defines those compromises ahead of time. It says, yeah, we'll get to resource management, but it may not be in phase one. It says, yes, the executive dashboards may reflect earned value or cost information, but it may not be in, until phase two. So, so the result of that is when we get to the portfolio governance, we recommend that part of a portfolio governance process is not only the things that Graham talked about earlier in terms of how we bring ideas in, how we put the business cases together, how we compare these ideas to one another to optimize and choose the best set of choices and then to go run those projects successfully. But the part of that process is actually a governance process that looks at how are we running our projects? How can we coach and mentor our teams? How do we look at process adoption and audit those processes? And if it's not going well, we have reporting and escalation, not just about how the projects are going, but how governance itself is going. So that we can then intervene, provide corrective action, provide ongoing support to that community. So, so there's a lot more I can talk about here, but what I'd rather do uh, for today is just talk briefly about uh, what next steps are. Uh, our practices around those three columns, uh, you'll see a lot of, what I, again, what I call implement stuff, right? So we implement, uh, obviously, project server, including the portfolio aspects of that, the collaboration, which would be the SharePoint, uh, the training, education, and competency development, uh, certainly some of the customizations that would occur. Uh, to get those solutions implemented. We provide project management staffing as well as, um, as add-on products for uh, streamlining the use of project management technology. So before I get to the questions, one final slide here. Uh, if, if you're interested in hearing anything more about uh, the technology or if you're looking at potentially thinking about column one and three instead of just diving headlong into column two, from a strategy standpoint and a governance and adoption standpoint, we can provide uh, a look at the requirements for getting project management reporting, technology environment, resource planning, and, and portfolio and project management governance in place. These are the hot spots that we typically see. And, um, and at the bottom, really, if you look at common challenges, you know, the ill-conceived technology deployments and their, you know, the, the harmful effects that they have on the mood of the organization to do more, that's, that's really, really where the challenge is. You know, there, if you work in a large organization, there's a very, very good chance that your organization has already spent a lot of time, effort, and money to uh, put in a solution at some point in the past and it didn't go well. So uh, those, those challenges usually are addressed uh, pretty successfully through a phase one process with assessment uh, planning and tactical uh, strategy and tactical planning. Uh, the training and competency development shortcomings, you know, training is not just about a five-day or a three-day classroom, but there's an ongoing experience that needs to occur and really the, the right project management methodology and guidance to, uh, to support the processes. So enough on that for today. Um, if, if you're interested for next steps, uh, there's, there's a slide up here uh, with Jan's contact information. Certainly, uh, can Jan can the rest of our team. If uh, there's somebody who you know would like, uh, would like to have seen today's uh, webinar, there will be, uh, assuming our stop recording works today and is successfully captured, there will be a webinar out on our website 
You'll also see upcoming events out on our website. And um, so, so stay tuned for more information there. And then finally, uh, Jan, I think I'm supposed to turn it back over to you at this point. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, we do, Beth. We have two right now. Okay. Uh, what's the first one? Do we need to buy a separate license to use Portfolio Server? Okay, that's a good question. Let me see. I have my handy-dandy slide numbers here. Uh, just a quick refresher, if I could go back to, uh, let's see, I think it's going to be slide 10 because we added a slide here today. Let me just show slide 10 to answer your question. Um, if you look at the left-hand column, just a quick refresher, uh, what used to be Portfolio Server and Project Server, two separate, what Microsoft refers to an SKU or a barcode, if you will, a separate, a separate product number. Uh, I, I might have mentioned, maybe there's a little bit of confusion, I mentioned Port Project Server is now the combined product, but what that means is it's a single license. If you buy Portfolio Server, you get all the functionality that you used to need two products for. So if you bought Portfolio Server and Project Server for 2007, uh, you would now be able to buy Portfolio Server for Project 2010. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Did we have another one? You want to read it? Sure. Does Project 2010 facilitate agile project management and estimation practices? Uh, yes, I would say it does. Now, in, you know, in terms of uh, a project management methodology, uh, you know, I would view agile as, as a project management methodology and some of the things that Agile calls for would really be tasks within a project plan. So the way, the way projects are likely to accommodate this is A, through a project template that has a, uh, an Agile project management methodology included in it. And uh, you know, as, as you might have seen, like for example, from the, uh, the manual scheduling that Graham was showing today, you know, those kinds of features are really intended to be, uh, you know, the way I view Agile, uh, Jim, because I see uh, that's your name up there. Good to see you back on. Uh, you know, the, the, way, the way we view this is that you know, Agile is about having flexibility. You know, it's sort of the anti-rigidity and rigor that traditional project management has called for that says there's a fixed scope, a fixed schedule. The term that we use oftentimes is the iron triangle, that if you change one thing, if you, you, know, if you increase the schedule, you have, you're going to have to reduce, uh, I'm sorry, if you reduce the schedule, you're going to have to reduce scope or add resource. And really, Agile is about um, what it says is remaining Agile and, and having that flexibility about the future. So I would say that, you know, the, one of the features you would see is that the manual scheduling features uh, are allowable even for components of a project plan. So from an estimating standpoint, you can have that loose uh, uh, set of features that maybe aren't even conceived yet or, or haven't yet gone through a scrum session uh, uh, out there as uh, sort of placeholders, uh, high-level ideas with, with, uh, with loose estimates. And you may recall Graham typing in, I don't know, in the, uh, in the duration of a task. So I would say that all those features are intended to, uh, to really bring the flexibility that Agile calls for. And, uh, and really, in previous versions of project, would have been a little less flexible. Uh, are we, do we have time for any other questions? I think we could do one more, Gus. OK. What are the one or two main features that are compelling enough to make me want to move to Microsoft Project 2010? The two compelling features. OK. Um, well, I guess, I guess my favorites are, uh, and I don't know how much we covered this actually in, in the demo, but one of, one of the things, uh, one of my pet peeves with Microsoft Project has been the, um, uh, the difficulty in having uh, visibility into what's happening when you're scheduling resources against the task. In other words, uh, for those of you who are more sophisticated users of the project, you might know that it makes sense that when you're assigning resources to do that in something like a usage view, like a task usage or resource usage. Um, the vast majority of people we see using project are still um, uh, of the you know, sort of garden variety. 80% uh, of the world knows, knows about 20% of the features, which means a lot of folks use the Gantt chart. And uh, as, as some of you who are more expert in project would know that as you assign resources in the Gantt chart uh, in previous versions, you really didn't get uh, any real warnings about, about the, uh, the overallocation of resources. And what would happen is, you know, you merrily go your way, assign a lot of resources. When you get to the end, you go back and you, you do something called resource leveling. And I was always in favor, and what we've taught as a company for, for really over a decade now, has been what we call task leveling. 
as you assign resources to the task, make sure they're available. Or as those tasks change over time, make sure those resources remain available. Or as task durations increase, make sure we're getting the resources available that need to perform the task, even if it means reassigning that task to different people or, or rescheduling the task. And so uh, without getting into a lot of detail, there are some really great features in Project 2010 that really highlight uh, when it's happening, number one, the over-allocations, and number two, to help you go in there and do some deeper analysis of what the root causes are and to get it resolved. The other one, which I mentioned briefly on the last question we got, was this whole idea of manual scheduling. Uh, you know, a best practice that many of you have learned as project managers is the idea of as you plan, you collaborate uh, with the experts who know how to perform the tasks. And oftentimes those planning sessions call for some high-level stabs in the dark. And again, previous versions of project really didn't lend themselves to uh, having nebulous uh, thoughts about high-level tasks, about, you know, if we're in design now, all we can say about development is we think it might be three to six months, and we're going to try to time box it into a six-month period. So they would, be, uh, they would be two of the bigger ones. The other one from the server side, if, we get, if I can go to a third one, as we get off the, uh, the manual, uh, I'm sorry, as we get off the standard uh, desktop environment, some of the web-based scheduling where we can actually start to edit some of the plans uh, directly within the web-based uh, components. So there are some of my favorites. There are certainly others uh, that are pretty compelling. But because we are now at 4.01, uh, I'm going to thank you all for attending today and uh, hope to see you in a future webinar. Thank you very much and have a good day.